Thank you everyone for joining. Um, we are going to start the webinar in just one or two more minutes. So if you have last minute water or tea or coffee that you want to get, there is still a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for people to come in. So thank you for your patience. We'll be starting as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, we will be starting the webinar very, very <clears throat> soon. We already have nearly 200 people, so I think um, we should get going. Great. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. Welcome to the LAN Dialogue webinar series, organized in partnership with the Ford Foundation, the LAN Portal Foundation, the Tenure Facility, and the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities. Thank you for joining us. My name is Thin, I'm a journalist, and I specialize in food systems and climate change. And I'm delighted to be moderating today's session on gender and biodiversity, how indigenous and local community women safeguard nature. Now, the idea behind this webinar series is to raise awareness on the land rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. These rights, we think, are a prerequisite to achieve national and international goals around forest governance, food security, climate mitigation, economic development, and of course, human rights. Now, before we start, let me just go through some basic housekeeping rules. Now, the webinar is in English, but we have simultaneous translations in Spanish, French, and Portuguese. To access the translations, you just need to the globe icon at the bottom of your Zoom window, and then you click on it and select the language that you want. We've scheduled this webinar for about 75 minutes and we've set aside time for Q&A as well. So if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A box and not in the chat box. However, please use the chat box to let us know who you are, which organization you belong to and where you're joining us from. And of course, feel free to tweet using hashtag Len Dialogues. That is one word, Len Dialogues. And you can follow the live tweeting from LAN Portal and Tenure Facility Twitter accounts. Finally, we're also recording today's session and we will be sharing the link with you later. Now, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's turn our attention to today's topic, which is the knowledge of indigenous and local women and the crucial role that they play in maintaining, protecting and enhancing biodiversity. This knowledge, which has been passed down through generations, has also been integral for Western science. And that includes the development of medicines, as well as a deeper understanding of weather patterns and climatic events. But as many of us know, through our lived experiences, that women's role in many societies remain marginalized. And for indigenous women, that marginalization is often doubled, right? First, for being indigenous, and second, for being a woman. Now, they're seen and treated as beneficiaries 
instead of as partners and agents of change. Now, today, we have a fantastic lineup of amazing Indigenous women leaders, and we're going to talk about how best we can amplify their voices and actions, particularly in the lead up to COP16, for, which is short for the Convention on Biological Diversity Conference of Parties and the Global Biodiversity Framework. Now, let me introduce you to our speakers who are going to help us understand the whole debate better. Um, in the interest of fairness, I'm going to introduce them in alphabetical order. And please be a bit patient if they're a little bit slow in coming online, because as you can all imagine, they're joining us from parts of the world where the connections are not always stable. So we're trying our best to facilitate them to be with us today. Now, first, we have Aisatu Omoru of the Mbororo Fulani people of Chad. You can see her on the screen wearing this amazing outfit. Now, Isatu is the deputy coordinator of the network of indigenous and local communities for the sustainable management of forest ecosystems in Central Africa. We also have Christian Pankararu, who is from the Panka Pankararu people of Brazil. Now, Christian is part of the Articulation of Indigenous Peoples of Brazil and co-founder of the National Articulation of Indigenous Women Warriors of Ancestrality. And last but definitely not the least, we're also expecting Jocelyn Kasama of the Ambara people of Panama. Now, Jocelyn is the coordinator of the youth movement in the Association of Embera Women Artisans. She's also part of a team of young women who are working to rescue the ancestral Embera planting system. Now, Jocelyn is going to be actually speaking for two people, herself as well as her grandmother, Gloria, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today due to unforeseen circumstances. Now, how we're going to do this is that we're going to fit in three rounds of questions uh, to our speakers, as well as some time for Q&A over the next 60, 70 minutes. So I would appreciate it if our speakers could keep their answers precise and not more than three minutes each. Um, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. And depending on how the speakers um, are present, uh, we can also make this a lot more interactive. Now I'm going to start with the first question. Um, and I want to start with ISO2. Um, now, we've heard a lot about the important role that Indigenous women play in biodiversity preservation and climate mitigation. We've heard this from researchers, we've heard this from civil society, we've heard it from Indigenous women themselves. But I said, could you perhaps explain to us how this actually works in your community? How do women in your community contribute to this, contribute to biodiversity preservation and climate mitigation? Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be able to participate in this webinar. And I would like to congratulate all the organizers and thank them for inviting us. So as uh, has been said, my name is Aisatu Umaru. I am the uh, um, coordinator of Repaliac. And I'm also the deputy coordinator of the uh, Association of Pearl and Indigenous Women in Chad. So I represent uh, women in Central Africa within the Global Alliance. As you know, women all over this uh, planet are the ones who take care of communities, take care of families. And so through these women, there is preservation of uh, biological diversity, but also of the environment more broadly. So I'll tell you how it happens. So the woman is the one who takes care of her family, her community, as I've already said. So she's the one who uh, seeks out leaves to uh, cook. She's the one who educates children. She's the one who also takes care of those the, the health of these children. In terms of health, she's going to have to go into the bush to look for the leaves, the, the branches, the roots uh, that are going to help her treat her children. And that's part of biodiversity, but it's also part of this very rich um, traditional knowledge of these women. And when she does these trips, this woman takes her children and shows her shows them, well, you see, this leaf can help you to uh, cure this 
um, disease, this leaf can be used to eat, this leaf can be used for something else. And so during these explications, she will be able to kind of make them aware of the characteristics of these different plants and say, for example, these plants are very toxic, but we need to preserve the plant that is growing here so that next time that you're sick, you can find these uh, plants that are useful for, for treating yourself. And in the same way, when she sees a tree that is sick, she's maybe going to try and, and help this tree. Or if she, for example, uh, takes the bark from this tree, she's going to use mud or maybe uh, prepare a poultice that she's going to apply uh, to the tree so that this tree can then really kind of heal from this this um this wound that she's inflicted on the tree and that protects the tree and then that in turn protects families in the community and that's how women participate in the preservation of biodiversity and they're also a lot in 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 they work in prevention really so when they go looking for these natural resources they actually venture a lot further into the bush than usual. And then they, they will realize actually that we're losing, um, you know, these trees or these branches and uh, et cetera, because the further they go, the, the more they realize that this is a real problem. And sometimes what they do to try and counteract this is they look for seeds and they try and bury them in places where they think they'd be able to grow and so they try to and they try to protect maybe young sprouts as well with thorny plants or by protecting them with a little gourd over the top uh, to avoid that these sprouts are damaged really so and that allows them to grow and and then be useful a few years down the line and that's work that is done by women because they are the one who take care of, of all of this and of the family, as I said. But that's not the only facet of what women do, because by protecting what is there, um, we can restore what is on the point of, of disappearing. And further than that, it allows you to maybe um, foster the, 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 the plant cover that is disappearing. So that allows us to um, mitigate the impact of climate change locally and on top of this plant cover they also take care of the fauna of the wildlife because when they go into the bush they'll find little quail eggs um, other birds sometimes of course they take these eggs to survive to eat but they don't take all of these eggs they know that they need to leave something behind for the mother the mother quail to then be able to continue uh, reproduction. And in the same thing, when you see the population of these animals diminishing, well, we're going to talk among communities and say, well, oh, we've noted that this animal population is going downhill. So we need to be very careful to not eat too much of these animals. And that's how women not only protect biodiversity but also the environment more largely and also most importantly to the transmission of knowledge uh, to new generations so i think i think that's it i've managed to stay in my times i'm a teacher so i hope i've been clear no, that was fantastic thank you very much uh, Ms. Ruku, etc and 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 definitely going to come back to you for follow up on how you then sort of, you know, transfer sort of that knowledge, pass that through to the younger generation. Um, but for now, I want to bring in Jocelyn um, to the discussion. Um, Jocelyn, I see that you've joined us and I hope um, we're able to hear you and, 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 and see you perhaps as well. Jocelyn, can you hear us? Hi. Hello, good Jocelyn. morning. Buen dia. Um, we were just essentially asking a question around, you know, how um, 
how in your community women contribute to biodiversity preservation and climate mitigation. So if you could give examples of how it works in your community, that would be great. Well, one of the ways that we do to preserve the forests is in a way we preserve our culture our mother tongue and also trying to preserve our tradition traditional medicine Women try to use traditional knowledge, the knowledge that we gain from our grandparents when it comes to planting and harvesting, using no chemicals whatsoever. Through this, we are restoring the forests with a nature or local trees. Women also keep this, keep the balance that the family needs and protects the family and the and the people as a whole. So we are organized and we are daily concerned to preserve this culture. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. And I think one of the things that I hear from both, you know, Isatu and Jocelyn is not just in terms of preserving, uh, restoring, maintaining, but also making sure that, you know, the resources are not overused. Um, so it's also looking into the future and for the future generations as well. Um, Isatu, can I come back to you um, with the next round of questions? And this has to do with, you know, what you mentioned earlier about passing the knowledge from one generation to another. Um, I want to better understand how it works. Um, so if you could explain how it does in your community and what are some of the, the challenges that you face when you're trying to do this? Yes, thank you very much. It's great to be able to answer your questions. So, you know, transmission is, uh, is, a, is a necessary. When you are a woman, a, a mother, you need to show your descendants your children and your daughters especially they should see what you're doing how you do it where you do it so it, every step that you're of what you're doing is the school it's a, a teaching process the children the next generation is following what you're doing as i said before if we go to the forest when we go to the forest to pick leaves or or barks or roots we can go when there are things that are very secret if we have to keep them for us but most things we, we need to show to our children so for example when i remove the leaves to reduce my son's my children's fever i will not go alone i will go with my daughter and my son and I will tell them to remove the leaves. And while they remove the leaves, I will show them what is the best way to remove them. I won't just leave them uh, uproot the, 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 the plant completely. I won't also let them cut the head of the plant. I will really show them how to remove the necessary part. And any way to remove, to harvest, the, the way that we harvest permits the plant to regenerate itself in the best way. And so you need to be on site with the children to show them or with whatever the person you need to teach so that they learn and they know exactly how to do this harvesting and even where to hold the plant when, while harvesting it. So this transmission is very general. And when we go to the forest, it's not just one only one thing that we teach it's many things that we teach 
when I go with a child, for example, on a, on a, a cloudy day like today, you can tell them, look, it's a cloudy day today, but it's not going to rain. We will do our work as we normally do. And the child who is naturally intelligent will tell you, how do you know it's not going to rain? Because I can see the clouds, a big black dark cloud. It looks like it's going to rain. And I would say, no, it's not going to rain because the signs aren't there. And then the child will ask, what are the signs, mommy? And I will say, these are the differences. These are the signs. So there are things that we harvest from the forest that are seasonal as well. And sometimes they depend on the climate. So if there is going to be a lot of rain, a lot of plants don't grow at all. And when it's dry, uh, other plants won't grow at all. And some plants grow all the time, independently of the weather, whether it's rainy or not. And some plants grow, but then when there's a lot of uh, water, they don't come out. So all of this we need to teach to our children. And even the reaction of the animals or things, this way the mother teaches uh, while using. And, and this uh, permits the... This allows children to assimilate the information from a really young age. My, my son, for example, is seven years old, and he knows a lot of things that even 40-year-olds don't know. So very, from a very young age, from the age when he's crawling, we, show, we try to show them things. To start with the ants that are on the ground, because we leave our children to, to crawl all over the ground. Even if we are in more modern houses, we let them go out and onto the grass, and we show them to crawl on the ground and they will eat the ground, the earth, sorry. And so this is how we transmit our, our traditional knowledge to our children. For example, how to milk a cow. We can do it in different ways, but what is the best way and why? So all of this we need to transmit to the, ch to the child in the most effective way. So you know that in, in Africa we say, there are not people that have more knowledge than the pulp, the pels, because we are in, con in contact with nature, with the forest, and we have a lot of experience. And we've done and redone many times. And this allows us to transmit in a very loyal way and in an efficient way to our children. So we could continue with these themes later and more questions later. Yeah, just a, uh, I said to you, just a very quick follow up. Um, do you find it difficult um, when you are trying to pass that traditional knowledge to your children or to the younger people? Um, are they are they are they receptive, um, or is it actually difficult to do it, uh, even if it's not within your family or to to the younger generation? Are there any challenges around around doing this? Yes, ab absolutely. There are challenges. There are always challenges. But when you try to teach a child something and the child is not interested, it hurts. Because it's like if we you see your house which is collapsing and you can't do anything. Our knowledge is our base of our life. It's our identity. So if the child does not know his ident our identity, is not interested, it really hurts. But if God preserves us, it's not happened yet for me. As I said, from the very young age, from the age that the child is is breastfeeding, uh, this is where I, I start to teach him and, and make him understand certain things. So straight away, the, the desire, we say the some pela, oh, the, the pela blood can be diluted, but it does, never disappears. So when they have the pale blood, he will always have these, this knowledge and this, uh, which, which is in his DNA, anchored in his DNA, and he will always try to understand why things, how they, how they are, how, how to learn. It's this curiosity, this intelligence, this, this is part of the people is always there. It's always going to be there. So the child will, will try to look, to search. To understand uh, so we can manage this with but with all this modernity which is up which is coming now I don't it's gonna be more difficult to manage and especially with the changing environment but anyway we are here to defend as uh, indigenous people we're here to defend this 
I hope I've responded to the question. Very much so. Yes. Thank you so much, Esther, too. Um, Jocelyn, can I come back to you again, please? Um, I understand also that Gloria, um, Jocelyn's mother, actually is able to make it. Um, Gloria um, actually only speaks Embera. So perhaps Jocelyn can help uh, be the um, be the interlocutor here as well. Um, Jocelyn, I actually had this question for you um, to answer in two parts. Um, first, on your grandmother's behalf, uh, as to how you know how she does uh, this knowledge transfer from one generation to another. And the second part was actually to ask you to talk about your own experience um, as a young woman, um, as a recipient of this knowledge transfer um, and whether and how uh, technology plays any role in this. Um, so, you know, depending on if Gloria is is, is willing to answer the first part um, and if you can help um, uh, translate uh, or help us understand what she's saying, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Jocelyn, can you still hear us? Are you still here with us? I think um, the connection may have dropped out. Um, Jocelyn, I don't see Jocelyn anymore. I do see Gloria. Um, if either of you can, if you can hear me and are able to answer, or if not, we'll come back to you when you um, come back in again. And we can, um, we, I, I see that we already have quite a lot of actually questions from um, the audience. So it might actually be worth um, taking some of the questions already. Um, and then perhaps we'll come back to Jocelyn when, when she is able to join us again. Oh, no, uh, Jocelyn, are you, are you back here? I see, I see you online. Are you able to answer the question? Okay, I can't hear um, Jocelyn, so we'll park that one and then we'll come back um, to that. There are already quite a few questions, um, and let me just uh, take two first. Um, one is about what I what I mentioned actually in, in, in the introduction about how Indigenous women faces two challenges, one for being Indigenous and another for being female. How does the latter manifest itself within indigenous communities. Um, that's the first question. And the second one, and I said to you, I will come back, come to you to, to get your thoughts on those questions. Uh, so just uh, a word of warning. So the first question is about being a woman in an indigenous community and how does that manifest um, in your community? And the second is what types of support or activities funded by international donors have been the most effective and impactful in engaging Indigenous women in biodiversity conversation, uh, conservation, what types of support would be most helpful for you moving forward? So that's two questions. Um, do I need? I don't think I need to repeat the questions again, right? I said I think just feel free to 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 answer um, both at the same time. Okay, so they spoke about the steps that are necessary to help uh, women, the the, don the donor said that. So when you help women, you're helping the whole community. And I'll sh tell you how. If you give one euro to women, the first thing that she will do, she'll take that one euro and she'll go to the market and she'll buy a bit of oil, a bit of uh, dried fish, a bit of salt, and she'll come back because she's got the cereal at home, the mie, and she'll prepare a uh, millet, sorry, and she'll prepare a sauce which is very, a, a very delicious, and the whole family will eat. So if you've given to one person, the whole family will eat, will benefit. So in an African family, for example, in our communal families, you can go to about 20 people. 
So you see the impact of the one euro that you've given. So how do you help them? These women are not totally autonomous. They're marginalized within their own community. Everyone knows that uh, indigenous people are marginalized and discriminated compared to other communities, but the women within the commu or indigenous communities are marginalized again. They're discriminated against within their own community. So if we help them first to become more, to empower them and be more independent financially with the money that they that they earn and the activity that they do, the first thing that they will do is to eat something delicious. And a woman cannot eat on her own and leave the others. So the whole household will eat something good. Her children, she won't let them leave with torn clothing because she'll have some money, whether the husband brings some or not, she will look for clothes that even if they're secondhand, it's better than if uh, what they would wear if she wasn't working. She will try and find shoes for her children. She will also wear good clothing for herself. So you will see in the household of the woman that there is an activity, that there is some kind of financial autonomy. Everyone is different. They are eating well, they are sleeping well, they are well clothed. And this, what kind of autonomy do we need for these women? We don't need to bring them to France to do commerce and come back. No, they need, they don't need that. All we want is, we are in a planet which is warming, first of all. And so we have women who are seeing the natural resources disappear. What do we need to do to help? We need to help them in, improve their environment and to obtain a uh, money through that they can transform local products for example in my community women can transform uh, uh, dairy products but they can also transform agricultural local products they can transform forestry non-ligneous forestry products they can also do agroecology even better so they will have a garden, for example, a parcel for her where there are trees, which are medicinal trees and fruit trees and sacred trees in a main, in one same uh, location. And they can do a small, uh, a small plot where they have their fruits and their, their uh, crops and they can sell it to make some money and they can also harvest it for their local uh, food so women can do a lot of things with very little you know we have had many projects uh, that for example we've had a, a project for two thousand dollars and it which was able to give a, over 50 women and it was more impact than one project which was 150 million dollars because it was direct and they knew what they wanted and they did it more clearly and it had more impact for them so that's one way you can help these women and how they can manage it and manage the and manage others i think i've answered the question i don't know if i forgot the second question if you can repeat it for me Oh, I think you've actually, so the question was around, you know, how the marginalization sort of manifests within communities, but also what are some of the ways for donors, what are some of the projects that donors have done that is helpful and what could they do to, 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 to help you, which I think you've actually answered in some ways, you know, like very practical, um, wonderful examples um, and, 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 and they don't have to be big big projects, right? Like you said, not bringing them to uh, another continent uh, to teach business studies, but to for them to be able to stay at home and and, and look after the community and, and improve their lives, right? That's perfect. Thank you, Isa too. Um, Jocelyn and Gloria, I, I see um, both of you joining on video just now. Could I ask you both to come again and 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 if possible um, to join in the conversation, if you could hear us.
Jocelyn, Gloria, are you still there? Ah, perfect. Jocelyn, could you, um, would you be able to do some translation? Is it possible? What your grandmother just said? Yes, hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. And I was just asking both of you about the knowledge transfer, right? Uh, Jocelyn, would you mind, and, and Gloria, um, would you mind just perhaps speaking briefly about how you transfer knowledge from one generation to another in your community. So for the listeners, it's because Gloria only speak Ambera and uh, Jocelyn is trying to translate it back from Ambera to Portuguese. And then I think the translators are then trying to translate it. So that's taking a little bit time. So please be patient. Thank you. Sorry, Jocelyn, Gloria, back to you. Well, I have the response. In my peoples, we teach women in the, in the new generation or the next generation, we show how to transmit traditional knowledge. We explain about traditional medicine, our cultural traditions, our dances, the dances that we do in our community, our dresses, our paintings, where do they come from? All of that knowledge, we do this through teaching our children, through teaching the participants inside the communities, telling them that our culture it's not to be forgotten, it's not to be lost. And in the way we explain traditional medicine is explaining what each leaf or what each plant is used for or what does it do so they can understand more about traditional medicine. Jocelyn, would you also be able to just very briefly talk about your perspective as a young person, you know, getting this traditional knowledge um, and whether, do, you know, does technology plays any role at all in, in, in you receiving it or in you sort of maintaining some of this knowledge? Um, it would be great to, to, to hear from your perspective as well. Well, from my perspective, I believe it is really important to learn all of this because we are losing this in our communities a little bit. From my grandma, I was able to learn a lot. As a part of the youth, I've been trying to involve more young people and more children as well so they can understand and learn more about our tradition and culture and yes concerning technology i believe yes it is important because as a young person i don't want that to get lost and with that we will be able to have those knowledge that knowledge that comes from our ancestors and we don't lose it at all
Great. Thank you so much, Jocelyn and Gloria. Well, I hope you will stay so that you can answer some of the, the questions um, and the Q&As, uh, which I'll come back to you. I've just been told that um, we have a, 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 another panelist, Sarah, who is um, standing on behalf of Christian, who cannot make it. Um, is Sarah? Um, is Sarah here? Hi, um, Sarah. Hello, it is really nice to see you all. Great. Uh, it's so good to have all of you. Um, thank you so much for joining at the last minute, Sarah. I really appreciate it. We were just asking the other speakers to sort of share how, you know, in, 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 in reality, women works to preserve biodiversity, and safeguard indigenous knowledge, and also how the knowledge transfer work between generations within the community. Could you perhaps uh, speak a little bit about how it works in your community? What are some of your experiences? Well, good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for allowing me this space. It's a pleasure to be able to share the experience that we have in our communities and our territories. Women play a very important role, fundamental role in the in keeping that connection with Mother Earth alive, especially when it comes to retrieving the knowledge through our medicine and through the uh, cultural customs that we have in our own communities. And we try to have this very close link with our Mother Earth and our traditions. Because in Mother Earth, we have the essence of our true connection. And it's the essence of our work. And knowledge is still the main ingredient to be able to move towards uh, the development but with identity and in the case of women we are restoring our forests and that because of illegal logging has affected the diversity that we depend on as indigenous people especially women when this impact comes women are the ones that being affected the most and in this process, this vulnerability, we are, through this vulnerability, we're trying to contribute to that, uh, to have a good balance between the nature and natural resources. And that's our, that's our work, that's our task, how to keep and reivindicate the learnings, these learnings to the children and to women so they can continue and carry on this legacy that our grandparents are leaving us with. And they are leaving us this to continue with identity and the connection with our forest. Um, Sarah, that was my fault. I should have asked you earlier to introduce yourself a little bit um, first. Would you mind doing that? I uh, just very briefly. Yes, I'm Sara Omi. I am from oh I'm from the Emberas peoples from Panama. Great, thank you. And I see that Christian has joined. I'm also president of the women coordinator of the indigenous leaders of the Mesoamerican Alliance and also in the JTC, uh, the Global Alliance of Territorial Communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Sorry, um, I didn't intend to cut you off. Uh, the, the, there was a bit of a connection. Yeah, Christian has also joined us. Um, Christian, can you come online? And um, well, you're online. Can you switch on your camera if you don't mind? I saw that you came online just now. Hi, Christian. Thank you so much. We're glad you're able to make it. Can you hear us? Uh, 
uh, maybe the connection might not be so great. Perhaps Christian, it might be easier. Perhaps if um, you switch off the video. Yes, I can see you and hear you quite well. I'm searching for a signal. I'm going to try to speak anyway. We are here. First of all, good morning, everyone. Good morning, ladies, women, non-women. We are here concluding an activity. Regarding the 23 goals established since COP15 in Montreal, and we are now holding consultations with uh, traditional and indigenous communities, family, farmers. So we are mobilizing 120 people wow. to come here apart from our partners. And I am uh, one of the organizers, so uh, it's taking a lot of my time. And we end up only being able to give attention to emergencies. I know that my it's it's looking good here. You cannot see these the beautiful scenario behind me. Unfortunately, I cannot show it to you. Let me try. Anyway, we are here now concluding this activity and each goal for each goal. Our peoples are bringing five proposals at least and of those we are selecting one priority of those five because those are key topics for us, key points, and we still have to go through other sectors, government, state governance, um, ministries, industries, private sector in general, uh, academia, and we call, we call the academia sector and us so we are still holding this meeting that is going to discuss those strategies and an action plan on biodiversity for brazil and this is going to be presented by brazil at cop 16 and this is a preparatory moment it's being very productive because we are also being able to make use of these spaces to bring to everyone, to all the participants in a more didactic manner. What is the Convention on Biodiversity? What is the Nagoya Protocol? What are the international mechanisms that strengthen the presence and participation and collective uh, construction by indigenous peoples and the traditional communities as a whole. Because when we go home, we are asked all those questions by those who remain in the territory. So we need to be able to discuss uh, loss and damage, environmental loss, uh, direct financing to the communities, sovereignty, uh, nutritional uh, security, for food, food safety, carbon credits, and so on. How companies, how businesses are relating to those spaces and how we are involved in the, this discussion and progress. Progress is an amazing thing. So we are strengthening ourselves in those spaces since we have gone through a six year mm -hmm uh administration six years uh during the bolsonaro government and the two years mm -hmm. before him after the coup against president dilma so bolsonaro uh, uh eliminated any instrument that validated our participation in councils in commissions any any forum everything was thrown away and we were not able to make progress so since last year those discussions about the biodiversity convention um we have 
try to bring those topics in a more accessible manner to our public. So I am a member of the Sectorial Chamber of the Guardians of Biodiversity, and we are working on diluting those technical themes so that our peoples in their own languages, in their own ways of being, can comprehend those, understand those, uh, those, those themes and uh, use them as mechanisms to safeguard their sacred knowledge. Since traditional knowledge has a lot to do with what is sacred to us and what is delicate in, in our position is that we are and we are being affected by misogynist, patriarchal uh, structures that are imposed upon uh, to us, and and we um, we are preparing to to confront those structures. So we are preparing to take a better stand in public forums and in COP sixteen in the biodiversity mm -hmm. COP that is going to be in Cali, irregardless of where it's going to take place, even if it were in Turkey. This has brought a lot of life to our movement. And people are asking, what is this conference? When did it start? What is this about? Because if you're discussing climate change, you have to discuss biodiversity because the absence of biodiversity is causing climate change. So let's discuss the origin of the problem. So the movement right now is uh, effervescent. Everyone is planning and debating and participating. Everyone is, is uh, preparing to go home and discuss those themes at home. Dis to, they're preparing to discuss protocols, community protocols. It is being very interesting. And Kali is going to be a hot uh, moment for us. And and we are already preparing to participate also in the uh, climate conference next year here in Brazil. So we are preparing ourselves politically so that we can uh, participate not as tutored communities, but as actors speaking for ourselves. So it's, it's a hard work we have to do, but we will, in the end, we'll mash it all and make it a very nutritious, nutritious <laughs> food and delicious so everyone can eat and share. I'm sorry I took so much of your time. Thank you for this space we're talking. No, thank you so much for joining us, Christian, despite that crazy schedule. And even though we can't see your background in full, we can sort of guess um, how beautiful it must be. And we can definitely feel and hear your passion um, and your and your and your work in there. I said too, I saw you raised your hand. Did you want to add anything to what Christian was saying and and what what Christian, what you talked about with COP sixteen and the global biodiversity framework was perfect because that was going to be the next question I was going to ask you. But I said too, did you want to come in and add anything? Uh, no, it was just. <laughs> It was just an error that I well, put but, hand up. Sorry. But since you're here, I might as well um, ask you, what do you, you know, um, Christian talked about um, what she wants to see with COP16 and global biodiversity framework and all the all the stuff that, you know, they're now working, particularly in Brazil, right? Um, after six years of, of, of an administration where indigenous people were marginalized and pushed aside, they're really working towards it. What about yourself? What would you like to see in an ideal world? What would you like to see happen at COP16 and with the, with the, with the framework? So, you know, I've never been to COP, the, or the biodiversity COP, but still, as Christian said, we can't just talk about climate change without talking about biodiversity. These are, these are things that go together. And what's ideal for me would be that there is a p effective participation of women at the biodiversity COP because the women are the guardians of the, biodivers of the biological diversity at a global level. So they need to be present and they need to show what is happening. And they also need to be accompanied for specifically there needs to be a specific accompaniment for these women. 
if they were a company, they can participate to the meetings in an effective way and they'll be listened to. And then that they can be accompanied in their activities as well afterwards. So in this way, by next year, we could come back with further results of the actions that we were able to have on the ground, the results that we could harvest, and we can present those. And maybe within five years, we could compare with the world of today before the massive participation and effective participation of women. And after this time of effective participation, I'm sure that Christiane in her region, she, she uh, achieves miracles, uh, changes the weather, etc. And we in Africa are doing everything we can to protect the environment, to diversify. So the strength of all these women allows the planet to not uh, uh, go past the 1.5 degrees of uh, target for the climate change. So what I think is that we really, this is what we really need to do to, to achieve the goal. I hope I've answered the question. Yes, thank you so much. Um, let's move on to the q and I have already taken a couple of questions at the beginning, but there's a lot more that has come in. So let's let's try and, you know, spend the next 10-15 um, minutes focusing on answering some of the questions. And Jocelyn and Gloria, can I bring you back in as well? Um, and I'm going to take three questions um, at a time. And let me just take three now. Um, and they're all sort of related as well. Number one is, um, can you describe your personal connection to the land and how it influences your approach to conservation? Um, number two, what are some of the biggest challenges you faced as a woman working in land conservation? So personal connection to land, how it, how it influenced your approach to conservation. What challenges do you face in doing this because you're a woman? And the last bit is what has been the most effective? What are some of the strategies that have been most effective in, in, in promoting land conservation in your community? Um, Gloria and Jocelyn, can I ask you to come in and answer this um, question first? And, and then maybe I'll ask um, Chris Jan and I said to you to answer these questions as well. Um, Jocelyn and Gloria? Could you please repeat the questions one more? Sure. So number one is your, can you describe your personal connection to the land and how that influence how you do conservation? Um, and what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced in doing this as a woman? And the last bit is what are some of the best strategies um, in terms of overcoming those challenges and promoting land conservation in your community? Did you get that? Yes, yes, all good now. I cannot uh, hear my grandma. I cannot hear her right now.
Jocelyn was telling us that she is not able uh, to hear what uh, her grandma is saying. I don't know if she's able uh, to hear her now or not. Um, Jocelyn, are you still having trouble hearing your grandmother? I, is, is it better now or would you like uh, Gloria to sort of repeat and, and maybe speak closer to the to the phone? No, I wasn't able to hear her. So I don't know what she said at all. Okay. Apologies. Yeah. Um, could you, um, Gloria, would you mind um, sort of speaking a little bit louder and closer to the phone if that's if that's possible, which if you don't mind answering that question again, just a little bit. I, I can hear you, uh, Thin, but I cannot uh, listen to my grandma or the, uh, the other girl that uh, talked before. Okay, maybe let's try and see if we can resolve this technical issue, um, but uh, um, and 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 then we'll come back. But Jocelyn, do you also have any anything that you want to add to those questions around personal connection to land, some of the challenges being a woman, and whether you found any strategies to overcome it? Yes, of course, I would like to um, add a, a couple of things about my expectations. So we get in touch with our motherland um, by preserving um, our land and by demolishing the blockades. Uh, young leaders and girls are trying to be more empowered increasingly empowered. We are trying to see how we can help our community and how we can connect better with Mother Nature. Great, thank you so much. Um, Christian, you're still here, right? Can I ask you to, to, to share your thoughts on those questions? And Sarah, if you don't mind coming in after Christian as well, I'd like to just give you a bit of a warning and then we'll go to Esther too. Uh, I don't know if you've uh, heard me, uh, Thin. Yes, yes, we did. Thank you. Well, I am connected to the land because I am. I belong to the territories. I've been there. I've been to many countries, but I need to come home, re-energize, recharge my batteries, and reflect upon everything that I've been doing, the people that I've met, and to thank everyone for the partnerships that we are able to reach, the project that we can make feasible and execute. I absorbed, I have absorbed i have understood this is my matter this is my body but this is not about me i am just a spokesperson for my people and when i have an international agenda and i talk on behalf of apib this is what i'm doing this is the articulation or the organization political organization of indigenous peoples of brazil so we have to have the humility to listen to everyone and represent because the, because of these people those uh, i have been able to come so far so connecting to the land is key it's like my roots are my elastic bands they have i, I stretch them but they pull me back i there's no way i can disconnect from earth because we are earth and we have to respect it to be um, accommodated by it as well when we need it. So being a woman is difficult. It is difficult to occupy spaces. We, also, we still go through 
uh, tutorship and censorship sometimes. Uh, and uh, when I feel that I am I'm being uh, tutored, I want to leave. I, I don't want this place or people think they know what is best for me and they want to tell me how long to stay, where to stand, what to say. I don't need that. I know who I am. I know what I am defending. And I refuse to be in that place of accepting uh, vertical imposed uh, situations, vert vertically imposed. And every provocation causes a reaction. If I disagree with what is being imposed, I am going to rebel. I'm going to refuse to accept. And even though I may lose, sometimes I am going to voice my opinion, even though my opinion is not heard, but I'm not going to be silenced. I will not be silenced because it is important that somehow I echo the voices that I represent. This is not about me. This is my voice and my body, but this is not about me individually. So if I'm going to be heard or not, this is not up to me, it's up to other people. And this is no longer about me either. And this is up to other people. So I let others think whether they will listen or not, they will uh, take my uh, thoughts or my expression, my voice or not. And uh, so we must always build our voices collectively and participatively because we are dealing with different sectors, different actors, private sector, uh, mining, uh, forest fires, illegal logging, kidnapping of women and children, pesticides, uh, political parties, policies, economy that does not favor us. It always places us in the, uh, as uh, slaves of the system. So I try to go to those spaces and bring those reflections and I'm echoing them somehow. If others are going to absorb what I'm saying, this is up to them. Some women also unfortunately have allowed themselves to accept quite naturally this this uh, control of their bodies and their minds because they can only be there if they do what they say what they tell what they're told you know so what social structure uh, determines what they can or cannot do by uh, patriarchy so we have to uh, exercise sorority and this must not be just a word but it needs to be made into action and we should be sisters and respect our spaces. So uh, so if you want to be a queen, we have to make you a queen. If you want to be an astronaut, let's make you an astronaut. You want to go to Mars, Neptune, let's make you go help you uh, accomplish your dreams. Because when a woman accomplishes her dreams, this is not utopia. This is not demagogy. Well, women are happy when they accomplish, when they feel they can. And if you can do what you wished, we should, you should also help enable other women to do the same. We should exercise humility and sorority. And this has nothing to do with poverty uh, uh, or poorness. When we talk about poorness, it's poorness of spirituality, poorness of respect and we are doing the opposite we're not being poor we are trying to enable those projects to happen we are trying to enable and uh, and uh, and host the communities if you will uh, receive their claims and i am proud to be here and to be the woman i am and the companions that i have my friends Isatu and sarah we met through the struggle and we connected in such a way I don't know if our ancestors united us in this place. Even one is in Africa, the other is in Panama, and uh, the other one is here in Brazil. We uh, make each other stronger. Thank you, Christian. That's a, um, I think somebody just just shared in the comment what clarity and strength, and I think I can't actually say it any better. Um, Sarah, are you still here? Would you be able to just briefly? Um, um, respond to those those questions, particularly around um, the challenges and what strategies have been effective in promoting land conservation in your community.
Sure, no problem. Um, Isa too, before we wrap up, um, um, anything you want to add um, to these questions? And actually there's one that is specifically targeted towards you. Um, um, it says, you know, you've given wonderful practical ways of transmitting Indigenous knowledge generationally. How do you use technology to make this information available to others who may not be in direct contact with nature? Yes. I think it can be difficult to adapt to technology because our technology is ancestral technology. So we tend to use technology for ourselves, but we prefer our, our ancestral technology. So I'd like to thank Christiane because she's already talked a lot about it, this idea of this connection to nature Um, you're back. Great. Oh, sorry, I'm having a, a little connection problem. So for us, the connection to nature, we're not, we don't talk about a connection to the earth, but we talk about a connection with nature. I'll explain the distinction because when you say nature, it, it, it encompasses everything. So the earth is part of nature. And that means that in my community, we're connected with the trees, with the grass, with the wildlife, with the rain, with everything that is around us. And that connection is specific and unique and, and unique, sorry, and, and absolutely sensational. Because you can really feel what a, a tree that has been felled is feeling. So if that tree is hurting, we feel it. You can hear the screams of these of these trees. You can see the tears of these trees. So this connection is a really incredible connection. We have a, a unique connection with the wildlife. It's really unique because in my community, certain people speak with animals whichever kind of animal you know they give them orders they they communicate and so that connection is is special and unique but as you well know this white technology does come and, and takes us out of what is is more important to us our children have said this is witchcraft no it's not who said that this is witchcraft what is ours it's our knowledge, it's our ancestral knowledge. If white people think that it's witchcraft, well, that's their business, it's not ours. We know the truth. It's our knowledge and our, our ancestral tradition. And so that's something that I would like to see preserved, to be um, handed down to be learned by everyone, by my children and by my community as well. So I want it to be something continuous so that it continues to be our identity for uh, a long time still. So that's the, the specific connection I wanted to tell you about. And there's another link that's very important that Christian already mentioned, and that is the link between the three of us. Christian, where is she? Sarah, where is she and where am I? We're in different places, but we're connected in a symbiotic way. Our connection is unique. We're trying to manage our problems and we are able to understand each other despite the distance. Christiane understands and feels what I'm trying to say and she understands everyone before she understands what I'm saying before everyone else. And that's the same for Christiani, for Sarah, for me. And that's something that's very specific and only exists within indigenous communities. And so I would like to, to really congratulate this kind of, this link between three spirits that allowed this link to, you know, traverse seas, oceans. And that's only one example. There are many others that exist as well. So it's a very, fascinating discussion but we're out of time I think that's the problem
I know we are out of time, but that is a perfect, I think, way to sort of end this this webinar where, you know, despite the distance, despite the time difference, despite the technical difficulties, despite the language, you know, differences and challenges, um, generational <laughs> challenges, um, you know, problems with connection. Um, also, you know, technology also allow us to have this webinar. So it's it's, it's both uh, both good and bad. Um, but I think it's been a fantastic, um, fascinating webinar, but we have actually run out of time. So we have to close the webinar now. Apologies for not being able to take all the questions, but could we all please give a virtual round of applause to all of our speakers? You know, Isa to Chris Jan, Sarah, who joined in um, for Christian briefly, Jocelyn, as a young woman who is trying to bridge both generations, and Gloria, the, the elder from the Embera, um, for her knowledge and insights. Um, and thank you, of course, to all the audience for your participation. We had more than 200 people, almost nearly 300 at one point, which is fantastic. Um, thanks also to our special partner for this land dialogue, the Global Alliance of Ter Territorial Communities, and of course, our host, the Fort Foundation, the Land Portal Foundation, and the Tenure Facility. It's been a real pleasure for me to moderate this event and may the symbiotic relationship and connections continue. Um, have a great day, afternoon, evening, or night. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody.